you excited for your first game of Warhammer? I am super excited. Awesome. So Ari is playing the Tyranids, and I am playing the Astra Militarum, the humans of the race. This is a classic battle of alien bug creatures versus the humans. So we are playing, uh, on, there's a set of nine missions to choose from, and you're going to randomly typically roll to determine which one you're playing. Uh, in this case, we're playing mission number 21, which is surround and destroy. So basically, I'll explain how the mission works, but your army, I designed it for you here. We're only playing with about 600-ish points, 650, somewhere in the neighborhood. Um, and then what normally games are about 2,000 points, but because this is a demo game and are just trying to learn, I wanted to keep it nice and tight. So your Tyranids are made of a Broodlord, which is your HQ choice. Then you have uh, four troop choices, two units of 10 Gene Stealers, a unit of 10 Gaunts, a unit of three Rippers. And then finally an Exocrine, which is your big beastie guy over there. So your armies are typically comprised of multiple detachments. Detachments are basically how you link your units together. So a detachment is made up of a lot of units. You're playing with one detachment and it's comprised of that Broodlord, the Gene Stealers, the Gaunts, the Rippers, and the Exocrine, like I just mentioned. I also am playing with one detachment. It's uh, got a Commissar, a Psyker, three units of 10 just basic guardsmen, a Lehman Russ, a Basilisk and a Chimera. So pretty easy going forces here, nothing too crazy. So I guess we're just gonna go ahead and go to the overhead camera and explain how the game works. So this is my Astra Militarum Force. It's pretty standard. Uh, I'm not bothering going into any specific legions or warlord traits because this is just a demo game and I wanna focus on the mechanics of 40K. So right here we have my platoon commander and we have my Chimera Psyker, three units of 10 guardsmen, a Lehman Russ battle tank, a Basilisk, and a Chimera. Pretty standard force right there for the Imperial Guard. And then over here we have Ari's Tyranid army. So she's got a Broodlord leading a unit of 10 Termagants, two units of 10 Gene Stealers, a unit of Rippers, and an Exocrine. Again, pretty standard force. We're not going to bother picking high fleets or warlord traits or any of that because we really just want to get her familiar with the mechanics. So this is our standard mission format. This is mission number 21, Surround and Destroy. There are six objectives scattered around the table. This is gonna be what we're fighting over. So basically, uh, typically a normal competitive game of 40K also allows you to choose secondaries and have that impact the way you score so it's not just the objectives we're playing over. I don't wanna get into all that right now, so we're gonna focus on just the objectives. To score an objective, you have to have a unit holding it, so having dudes on it, anywhere on this little mat. If you're at home and you're playing with, uh, the rule book will tell you to play with a 40 millimeter base, or like a poker chip size thing. So like this right here, and tell you to put it in the center, and then you measure three inches around it to know if you're controlling or not, how many models you have within three inches of the poker chip. <laughs> These mats are really cool. They are designed so that a poker chip 40 millimeters can stand in the middle, and then the three inch diameter, the radius rather, is already pre-measured. So now, if you have dudes on this mat, you're holding the objective. Mm -hmm. If you have dudes on the mat holding the objective at the start of your turn, start of your command phase specifically, but that's the same as start of your turn, you will score five points. If you have dudes on two objectives at the start of your turn, you will score 10. And if you have dudes on more objectives than I do, you'll score 15. So if Arya's got her dude here, and I have my guys here holding these two, I'm going to score 5 points for holding 1, 10 points for holding 2, and 15 for holding 1. Similarly, if Ari had dudes on this objective and this objective, then I would only score 10 points, 5 for holding 1, 10 for holding 2. So there's a lot of different ways to score points in the game, but it's all centered around these objectives. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So now we can get into the actual gameplay. So you start off by rolling for attacker and defender. So just roll a die. I got a six. You got a one. Not a good start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this roll really doesn't impact much. It allows you to choose whether or not you want to be the attacker or defender. The attacker, or sorry, rather, the defender gets to choose what side of the board they're on. So we're playing in the mission, which allows you to deploy your units up to 10 inches up the field along against the long edge. So basically here down the line of my deployment zone, or if you could just measure 10 inches out on your side, and it would be that, that would be your deployment zone. So 10 inches, here's some dice, 
and just mark it out. So basically what side you start on often impacts how you interact with the objectives. Uh, oftentimes objectives will be symmetrical, a few missions they're not. So it doesn't really impact that too highly, but you have to, have to consider into account the terrain on the table. Uh, this board is pretty symmetrical across the whole thing, so really the role for sides, attacker, defender, doesn't really matter. So I'll just be the defender for the sake of it and I'll sit, sit over here. So now I have to deploy my first unit. So I, you select one of the units in your army and you go back and forth alternating with your opponent on what units to deploy. So I'm going to start off by just putting one unit of 10 guardsmen just right over here. Now units have coherency. You can't have a unit spread out all around the table like so. Basically, you can think of it as everyone in your unit has to be within two inches of someone else in your unit. So uh, units of different sizes have uh, different coherency rules. A unit of 10 models, which is what I'm using and you're using for the most part, each model has to be within two inches of two other models. So right now, as you can see, everyone's all right. So every model is within two inches of every other model. If I had a situation like this, this guardsman is only within two inches of this other guardsman, so this unit is not in coherency. When you're, because he needs to be within two inches of two others. So if I did something like this, it would work because these two are within two inches of each other and this one, so they're all kosher. And then this one's within two inches of them and this guy and these guys are obviously all good. So there's some cool tricks you can do there. Uh, for the purpose of this game, I'm not gonna go too deep into them, but that's basically how coherency works. You can't move your unit for any reason voluntarily out of coherency, but there are times in the game where your unit's coherency will be broken, and then you will I'll explain how that works later. So Ari, now it's your turn. You can just pick a unit and put it anywhere you want in your deployment zone. I'm going to let you know that these rippers are going to be put into strategic reserve, so they're going to come in during the game, and you don't have to deploy them right now. Okay. So any of your other squads, wherever you want. I'm going to take these guys. Mm -hmm. And... Is it a good idea to put them kind of near you in order to... So the way our armies are going to interact, great question. Your gene stealers, the dudes in your hands right now, <laughs> are really, really good at close combat, and they're pretty fast, but they're not hard to kill with shooting. Okay. So oftentimes what you want to do is hide them behind terrain that blocks line of sight. <laughs> the way you check line of sight in this game is fairly complex, but the easiest rule of thumb is true line of sight. So literally bend down and see if your model's eye point of view can see what they're shooting at. If they can, shoot away. If they can't, then I can't shoot you. Mm -hmm. So using things like ruins with solid walls to hide your guys is a really common and important tactic to use in 40k. So I would recommend putting the gene stealers behind this ruin here, mm -hmm. and then maybe turn one they can move forward, and then turn two launch a charge into these guards and they kill them all. Okay, I'm done for that. So now I'm going to put my basilisk this tank all the way into this far corner. Now this is typically a bad place to put a tank because tanks can't really drive through walls so it's pretty trapped unless it comes at an extreme angle like this and it doesn't really have line of sight to shoot anything. Remember what I was just saying, if I were to bend down this tank is literally shooting a straight wall. Basilisks have a really cool rule though, indirect fire, which is common for a lot of armies, which allows it to shoot anything regardless of line of sight. It can shoot units that doesn't have line of sight too. So this basilisk behind this wall could lob shots upward and bomb those gene stealers on that side of the wall or wherever they are. So the shots on the basilisk are fairly powerful, but because it's indirect fire and it's Imperial Guard, it's pretty inaccurate. So we've got mixed results with that guy. And uh, now it's your turn to deploy another unit. So what are you thinking? Um... So I think you could either put some gaunts over here and try to hold this objective, or you could put gene stealers there and try to get in combat with my basilisk later on. Or you could double down and put your gene stealers here and really try to crush this flank because there are three objectives kind of near each other. A big mistake I see a lot of players go for tactically is to try to fight for every objective on the table. And that's overbearing and cumbersome and often overextends your army. Typically it's better to focus on a couple objectives near each other and dominate that zone of the table. Um, I think I'm going to put my other Gene Stealers back here, too. Okay. Alright, so now that you've done that, I'm just going to keep putting Guardsmen on. I see that Ari's putting a lot of resources on that flank, 
So I'm gonna try to fight her also and put some more gene stealers or some more guardsmen over here too to help out. All right, Ari, and it is your turn again. Okay. Um, so your broodlord wants to hang out with the gene stealers. <laughs> he provides some really cool abilities that make them better in close combat. So having him nearby when they get in co combat could be really good. He also has the character rule. Um, pretty much most like leaders in this game, most characters have the character rule, which means I can't shoot them. Um, if they are within three inches of another unit of yours. So like if they're near the gene stealers, I can't just shoot them mm -hmm. unless it's the closest target. So with, from the perspective of my army, if these rippers were here and the brutal was there, I could shoot him because he was the closest. But just like that, if he's not the closest and he's within three inches of a unit, mm -hmm. he's protected. They're like bodyguards basically. Okay. So you can put him Pretty much anywhere in the vicinity of those gene stealers, and it would be a pretty good, useful spot. All right, I think I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. Just put them. So the, the white part's not technically the same. Okay. So is that good? That's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one thing you might want to make sure to do is just make sure he's behind a gene right. stealer, so that way I can't get an angle and make him the closest. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then over here, I'm going to have these ten guardsmen in the Chimera. So this is a dedicated transport which allows it to uh, transport infantry around the table. And I'm just going to put this one right over here. So these guys are inside the transport. You can't interact with them. They can't interact with you until they either get out of the transport, which is a voluntary action I can take, mm -hmm. or if you blow up the transport. Okay. So then you have the Gaunt and the Exocrine left. Now that you have seen a tank, something of value, mm -hmm. that your Exocrine wants to shoot at, you could have your Exocrine kind of line up with my Chimera, and just call it a day there. Or you could use your Gaunts, which are pretty inconsequential, to bide out some time, see where I put the Lehman Russ, and then react to that. So I would recommend that, and just putting these Gaunts, you could put them over here and keep your whole army centered and try to really over dis overload this flank like we talked about. Or you could put them over there and make me deal with them. I could probably deal with them because they'll be all alone and isolated, but it would be inconvenient to my strategy. So that's the choice there. Um, I think I'm gonna keep everything kind of on this side. Okay. And put him right over here. All right. So I'm going to be clever and see around your trickery and put my primary Psyker, my lovely character, right over here to help buff up these guardsmen. It's one of my characters, so you can't shoot him either as long as he's within three inches of one of my units of at least three models. So now is just your big bad Exocrine. Um, so you're pretty much your options are down here to help control this flank, which is really what you seem to be going all in for or over here to line up with that Chimera like I talked about. Um, He's a big, heavy weapon shooting beast. He pretty much, wherever you put him, he ideally never wants to move again and just sits there and shoots turn after turn after turn. So if you put him in a spot that doesn't have good lines of sight, I can probably play around him. But if you put him in a spot that has good firing lanes, he'll do a lot of work for you. Um, does it, do you think it would be better here then, since it's a little bit more open? So this side is more open, but it wouldn't be hard for me to put my guardsmen at angles like this, yeah. where he would be stuck shooting a wall, and maybe drive my Chimera over this way where he's stuck shooting a wall. So I right. think um, keeping him either in a central location like this, mm -hmm. and then maybe accept that, okay, if you have to move him once to go this side, mm -hmm. or once to go that side, that'll suck, but it's only one time. Or putting him here and just being like, I am going to own these objectives. Either one of those is fine. I think I'm just gonna stick to putting everything on this side. Can I move this? Yeah. Okay. Squeeze. Sure, <laughs> not a problem. And then, well, I'm not gonna just roll over and die, so I'm gonna put my big Lehman Russ right over here as well, kind of lining up with you. Oh, and then I have my Commissar, since your last thing you have in reserve is the Rippers, but they will be coming in and joining us later, so nothing too much to worry about there. I'm going to put my Commissar right over here to lead my Guardsmen to victory. Okay. Right. So let's just quick recap those deployments. So this is my deployment in a nutshell. Basically just got 20 Guardsmen on the deployment edge here. My Primary Psyker and Commissar ready to lead them to battle. My Lehman Russ battle tank ready to eye up some shots on that Exocrine getting in a shooting war. My Chimera with 10 Guardsmen trying to drive around the flank here and get to these objectives and then my Basilisk ready for some indirect fire options as we go.
So Ari's got her two units of Gene Stealers and a Broodlord all behind this wall. Nice and out of line of sight from my firepower. Very good deployment here. Gaunt's in a position to run up to that Art of War objective in the middle and potentially cause some objective contesting early on. And the Exocrine lined up to either kill some Guardsmen or Lehman Russ. She also has three Rippers just hanging out in reserve. I'll explain how reserves work as they become relevant, but they could cause some major problems for me scoring the objectives. All right, Ari, so are you ready to get it started? I'm ready. You have any questions for me so far? Uh, not at the moment, but I'm sure I will. Yeah, okay, <laughs> sweet. So just roll for first turn. We'll okay. see what happens. I got a three. Ari got a six. Okay. So you and can choose whether or not you up. want to go first or second. Now, from a strategic standpoint in competitive 40k, there are a lot of reasons to choose either first or second. It's actually pretty well balanced between the two. In a game like this, where we're just practicing mechanics, uh, it doesn't really matter. Tyranids typically like to go first. Guard typically like to go first. So you probably have the advantage since you want to roll. Uh, would you like to go first? I'll go first. Okay. So the first thing that you do at the start of your turn is typically generate a command point. You do this at the start of every turn. Now armies start with 12 command points, and they typically um, spend them on stratagems which are basically like cool things you can do in the game that are specific to your army. There's a few rulebook generic ones, so we'll be playing with those, but I don't want to get too detailed into all of the specific codex stratagems. So, start of your command phase, you're going to go up to 13 command points, and now you're going to go to your movement phase. You would check to see if you're scoring any points for being on objectives also in your command phase, but you don't check that on turn one because it's kind of unfair. Right. So, in your movement phase, you pick all of the units in your army in sequential order and just move them. So to move a unit, you, you look at its movement characteristic, which you can find in its data sheet in your codex. Uh, for the movement characteristic of Gaunt's is six, for example, which equates to inches. So they can move up to six inches in any direction you like, forward, backward, sideways, circles. They can do whatever they want. The only restriction is they must maintain coherency, which I already talked about, mm -hmm. where every model must be within two inches of at least two other models. Right. You can, if you just move a unit normally, it can still fire and it can still charge. Now your Gaunts and Gene Stealers, Gaunts only have a 12 inch range, so if you move six inches forward and you shoot 12 inches, you have a total threat range of 18 inches, no one's within 18 inches. Mm -hmm. When you go to charge something, which we'll get to when it becomes relevant, you can basically charge anything within 2d6 inches of you. 2d6 being two dice added together, so mm -hmm. seven inches. In this specific case, the theoretically largest charge you could ever declare is 12 inches if you roll a six and a six. So if you move six and charge 12, again, your maximum threat range would be 18. So nothing is quite in range. So there's not much your gods can do aside from just move this turn, but they can also choose to advance. If you advance a unit, it can't shoot or charge unless it has rules otherwise, but you get that extra movement. So to advance a unit, you roll a d6, and then you go 5 inches. You can add that to your move, unit's move characteristics, so the Gaunts will go 11 inches. Again, whatever direction they want, just maintaining coherency. They can't shoot or charge, but they weren't able to shoot or charge anyway because you predetermined that by understanding their range brackets. So it makes perfect sense for your Gaunts to advance here. And then your Gene Stealers and Broodlord, these guys behind the wall here, they don't have any guns, so shooting is not a concern of theirs. And they have a rule that allows them to advance and charge when normally you couldn't. So it's almost always in your best interest to advance Gene Stealers and the Broodlord. So that said, you just pick a unit and move it, and then just go down the line, pick units, and just move them around. All right. And I do have one question. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any rules about moving through walls? Yes, there's lots of rules. For okay. <laughs> Great question. So there's different unit types in 40k. Mm -hmm. Things like guardsmen, gaunts, gene stealers, they're classified as infantry. People like you and me. So it's assumed that people like you and me, infantry, can just walk through walls. They just can't end physically in them. They find the nooks and crannies and any windows to crawl through. They get it done. Mm -hmm. Something like a vehicle it cannot go through a wall. It's not climbing through a window. Gotcha. So it has to go around the hard way. That's like your expert. Okay. Great question. Awesome. So keep in mind that you want to get yourself onto objectives because that's ultimately the only way to score points in this mission. Mm -hmm. And you need to stay there until 
through my turn. Like you just start score them right. at the start of your own turn. So if you just run onto this objective right here and I kill you, you're mm -hmm. not going to be here anymore. So right. that's a consideration. But for the most part, just keep that in mind. Your army wants to get in close combat with me as fast as possible, mm -hmm. or at least all of this stuff does. Right. This guy shoots a lot. These dudes, these dudes, you just took specifically to stand on objectives because they don't really do much else. Okay. And one more question. When I move something, do they have to move the full amount? No, it's okay. an up to. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I think I'm going to start with these guys. Okay. So just, uh, if you'd like to advance them, and again, there's no penalty to advancing in the case of Dream Stealers. Mm -hmm. So their movement characteristic is eight. Okay. So just roll a d6 and add it to eight if you want to advance them, and then move them however you like. You got a six. Six inches, all right. So eight <laughs> plus six is 14. They can go pretty much wherever they want, up to 14 inches. They could still declare a charge after that because they're gene stealers. Mm -hmm. So if anything is within a theoretical 26 inches of you, you could charge it, but you have to roll far enough to charge it. Right. Okay. Is that 14, right? Yep, so 14. Let's put it right there. And typically I'll use one hand to hold the tape measure and one hand to move a model at a time. Okay. And once you move the first couple, like that, mm -hmm. then you can kind of just put everyone else like right. in the same formation like behind. Is. going for the full-on <laughs> Zerg rush right now. This is exactly how Tyranids want to play. They just want to be blitzing across the table and charging you. All right, so who else wants to go? Um, I don't see any drawbacks to moving these guys too, now, right? Generally speaking, you pretty much always want to move every unit in your army. And even if you're, you don't, because like you're in a, you're sitting on an objective, you're in a happy spot, you want to at least think about it. Right. Movement is free, and it's ultimately what wins and loses you the game in 40k. Okay. So pick um, a unit and just go. So I think I'm going to advance these guys as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go three, plus mm -hmm. your movement characteristic is eight, okay. which you find is going to be 11 inches. Yes. And you can find your stats and all that in your codexes. I'm just letting Ari know because I'm not trying to make this take 25 years. <laughs> And it went to here, so is that where my front row should be? Yeah, or? your front row should okay. be... If you think so. about every model can only move that 11 inches, mm -hmm. so right. we're shortcutting it by kind of using the front model to dictate where the rest of the unit's going. Gotcha. But if you were trying to be precise about it, you'd have to measure every single model. Now, no one will really make you do that. Just try not to gain some extra inches here and there. Right. And uh, in this case... No, I think I can squeeze them in. Mm -hmm. in here. All right. All right. And then you got your brood lord and your gods. Okay, I'm gonna move this guy as well. Mhm. Mm so is he gonna advance or is he just gonna move? Um. Remember, he doesn't shoot, so there's really no penalty to advancing. Right. Okay. And you can so, always just roll a six and decide you don't want to move that. Yeah. Too. Okay. Um, I'm going to advance him. Mhm. Mm and, and what's his number already? He's eight. Eight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's gonna go eleven also. Okay. So is it fair to just move yeah, them you can just kind move. of where you, yeah. Yep, you can do that, no problem. Okay. Okay. And then you have those gaunts in the exocrine. Yes. So I'm not sure I want to advance these guys because I don't want to get too close to you and have you kill me. Right. So there's a couple things to keep in mind here. You could have them just go right up against this wall mm -hmm. and then that'll get them a little bit closer but not using line of sight I won't be able to see them because I can't see through walls. Right. Or you could uh, just run straight forward, like you said, and because they're like already a little bit in my face, now you're putting a lot of stuff in my face, it makes me want to kill a lot when I only have time to kill like one thing, per right. se. So there's different schools of thought there. It's kind of more of a tactical, strategic decision, but I think either one would be fine for you here. Could I try moving them through the wall onto this part? Or Definitely, does it yeah. have to be? No, no, you can okay. move in any direction you want just as long as you have enough distance. So you can roll your advance roll and see what happens. And then, it, like a lot of times, you'll see players roll an advance roll. Oh, I rolled a five. That's pretty good. I'm going to go for this kind of play. Right. Oh, no, I rolled a one. You know what? Let me hide behind the hill over here. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to advance them and use that as my strategy. Sure. All right. So, their base moves six. You rolled a six. They're going to go 12 inches. 
So I could... So you could get to that objective right here and hold it from that side. All right. I think I'm going to try and do that. Sure. So they're at this-ish level. Uh -huh. yeah, typically, I like to just kind of hold it over and then eyeball it. Okay. Yeah. If, if it's a really precise measurement, people can actually move the terrain to get the measurement just right. Right. But I don't think that's necessary okay. right now. And... Summit. That's two minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and now, now the exocrine. Have... Now the exocrine has a really cool ability. You know how we've just kind of been mindlessly advancing all of your guys because there's no <laughs> penalty? He has a lot of penalty. If he advances, he can't shoot, and he's primarily a shooting thing. Mm -hmm. If he moves at all, he suffers. Uh, he doesn't suffer minus one hit, but if he if he stands still, he gains plus one to hit, mm -hmm. and he gets to fire twice. So it's okay. like a lot of value standing still right there. Gotcha. So I, he's got plenty of line of sight to everything. He's taking right. shots. Okay. And is there like a range to him, or it's just line of sight? So everyone, okay. everyone, everything in this game is pretty much range based. Uh, great question. So like those guns, I was saying they're 12 inch range, mm -hmm. they can't really do much this turn. His is 36. 36 okay. will take you a well, well. Okay. Away. It'll matter if he was trying to shoot cross table over here, but mm -hmm. he's not interested in that right now. So uh, now we go into the psychic phase. Movement phase is over. So the psychic phase works is basically you select one of your psychers. In this case, we each only have one. You have your broodlord, I have my psyker. You select one of the powers they want to cast and then you just roll two dice, and then the power has a casting value, and then if you match it or beat it, it goes off. If you fail, it doesn't. Okay. So what I would recommend doing is use the spell Catalyst. It's a great tier in spell. You're always going to want to take it, which gives you a five up feel no pain against any damage you take. So what that means is when I shoot you, when you shoot me, we do damage to each other. Mm -hmm. And let's say like I have these guardsmen shoot these gene stealers, and I do, I, you fail four saves. I'll get through how that works mm -hmm. you know, as we get to it. When you fail four saves. What would normally happen is your unit takes damage. Each model can suffer damage up to its wounds characteristic before it dies. These are only wounds characteristic one, as most things in the game are. So every failed save will do one damage and kill a guy. Okay. So what Feel No Pain does is it's an additional level of saving. So if Catalyst is your spell, it puts five of Feel No Pain on these Gene Stealers. So after I do four damage to those Gene Stealers, you would roll four dice, and for every five up you get, you don't suffer that damage. So you'd actually keep one guy alive from that. Okay. So that's a great spell. You pretty much want to cast it every turn. Uh, you can cast it onto any one of your units. So where would you like to cast it? Um, I think these guys are probably in the most danger, right? Yeah, I would say so. So I'm going to go there. So you have, it's a power level six. You have to roll two dice and get equal to or above a six. Okay. And your codex will tell you that as well. Um, should I re-roll that one? Yeah, so okay. typically it's, it's good common practice from a social perspective to agree with your opponent whether or not you want to re-roll it if it's like this, pretty <laughs> clearly a five, but a little bit cocked, right. or if it's only re-roll like when you actually can't tell. Yeah. Generally speaking, I find it alleviates all the arguments if you just re-roll it until it's flat. Okay. So yeah, so I'll just re-roll that. So you did pass a on a six. I can attempt to deny the witch, which means if my psyker is within 12 in, or 24 inches of your psyker, mm -hmm. I can roll two dice and I have to beat you, so I have to roll gotcha. seven. But first, let's find out if I'm within 24, and it looks like I'm not, so I can't attempt to stop it, and it goes off. Right. They have Catalyst on them. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Sweet. Okay, so then uh, if you had more Psychers, we would just keep going down until you're right. done with Psychers. That's the only one you have. So now we go to the shooting phase, which is the okay. next phase of the game. So now you go unit by unit, just like we did in movement, mm -hmm. and select every unit that you'd to shoot with, and you shoot with it. So the Gaunts normally could shoot, but they advanced, so they right. cannot. Gene Stealers don't have guns, Gene Stealers don't have guns, mm -hmm. Purple doesn't have guns, Big Dude. Okay. So Big Dude uh, has a bunch of stats on his gun mm -hmm. and fires six shots. And because he stood still, he's plus one hit, so he's going to hit you on threes. And then it's strength eight to figure out what you need to wound. Basically, the way 40k works is you roll to see if you hit the other guy. Mm -hmm. And then you take your hits, you see if you wound the other guy, which is comparing their, your strength value to their toughness value. Okay. And then based on what that is, you did some wounds to them. Then you take your AP characteristic, armor penetration, versus their armor save. 
So super powerful weapons have a high AP characteristic, will make armor pretty irrelevant. Crappy weapons will bounce off of armor. Mm -hmm. So then you, you figure out what the other guy's save will be. He rolls his saves. If he fails, you inflict that much damage equal to your damage characteristic. Okay. A lot of steps, but it's pretty. Yeah. it comes by pretty quick. So right. basically, he has six shots, and he's going to fire twice because he should still. Okay. Um, he could try to shoot this guy. Mm -hmm. He's going to hit this guy on threes. He's going, because it's ballistic skill three plus, it just means you hit on threes. Mm -hmm. He's strength eight. You are, I'm toughness eight. Sorry, he's strength seven. I'm toughness eight. Mm -hmm. So basically, the way you can think of strength is... If you're equal strength to my toughness, strength mm -hmm. seven to toughness seven, you would win on fours, 50-50. Mm -hmm. I'm a little tougher than you are strong, I'm toughness eight, so now you need fives. If it was the opposite, I was a little weaker, your strength seven, if I was T6, you would need threes. Mm -hmm. And then if you were actually double me, if you were like strength 14 to my toughness seven, it would be twos. Okay. Or if it was the inverse, your strength seven, I'm toughness 14, it would be sixes. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, it's on these middle brackets of vehicles, it's always going to be those three, fours, or fives. Yeah. So right now you're hitting on threes, you're wounding on fives against him, mm -hmm. and then your armor penetration characteristic is three. My armor save plus is three. So what that means is you take my armor save value of three plus, mm -hmm. you take your armor penetra penetration characteristic and apply it to that armor save. So AP negative three applied to my three up save basically means I have a six up save. If you kind of take my 3 up, make it a 4 for AP1, make it a 5 for AP2, 6 up for AP3, it gets harder and harder the more damage you want. Then I would take whatever saves I have to, and then see how many I failed, and then multiply the number failed by the damage characteristic. Each, each, go, each shot that goes through my armor save does a certain amount of damage. So your damage characteristic is 2, so every save I fail will deal 2 damage. Alternatively, you could shoot the Guardsman, you hit on 3s, your ballistic skill never really changes, your strength seven on toughness three, so you'll wound on two, so most of your hits will wound. Your AP characteristic is three, and I have a five up armor save. So five up will go to a seven up, because, or sorry, five will go to an eight up, mm -hmm. um, because I'm AP minus three. But you can't roll an eight on one dice, so basically every one is gonna kill a guy. Mm -hmm. um, the damage characteristic two is wasted though, so damage in 40K does not overspill. If you do two damage to a one wound model, that extra damage is just lost. So you get better value of your damage against this guy than you would these guardsmen, mm -hmm. but it's harder to wound this guy because he's a tank. Now the tank is more threatening, but these guys are also numerous and play the mission fairly well. So it's a choice, definitely not an easy one, but would you like to shoot the tank or the guardsman? I think I'm gonna go for the tank. Did that all make sense to you as a lot? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, so shoot my tank, you have six shots, you hit on threes. Okay. So Everywhere. it's nice practice to just pick up your misses so your okay. opponent can confirm their hits. You got five hits, very good. So you pick those dice up again. Okay. And your strength seven against my toughness eight. So again, you need fives because I'm a little bit tougher than you are strong. Okay. So we got one. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have one save to take. I normally have a three up save, but AP minus three will bring me to a six up. So here's my one six up save. I failed it and I'm gonna take two damage. So Lehman Russes start with 12 wounds, because they're really beefy tanks, whereas like infantry will start with one. So my 12 wound tank is now down to 10 wounds. Just like that. Okay. And now your Exocrine has a rule. This is why he's good. If he stands still, he lets he shoots twice. So you could shoot the Lehman Russ again, or now you could switch targets and do the guardsman. I recommend once you've committed to something, just yeah. hammer it in. Okay. Alright, so shoot Lehman Russ again. Yeah. Threes to hit. So, not bad. Four hits this time, and then fives to wound. One more wound, so three of armor, minus three AP, it'll be a six up again. I fail that, and I'm down to eight damage. So slowly but surely, you are whittling him down. Um, it'll take a while, but these guys are tough. So that's the end of your shooting phase, because everyone else just simply can't shoot. Mm -hmm. Now we go to the charge phase. This is where your units try to charge my units and get in close combat and rip them apart with their claws. Okay. You can only declare a charge on units within 12 inches of you because you have to roll 2d6 and 12. Mm -hmm. So if these gene stealers are within 12, they can try to charge this unit, but you have to roll, uh, basically you have to get within one inch of them. 
So you actually only have to roll an 11 to get to right here, and then you can attack me. If you declare the charge and make it, you move your models, you hit my skies, you fight close combat. Uh, if you fail the charge, nothing happens, you just can't do anything else. Uh, when you declare a charge on a unit, I have the opportunity to spend one of my command points, and I have 12, to shoot you in a last ditch effort, it's called Overwatch. I'll only hit you on sixes, so it's not so accurate, just last second firing, but it is a chance for me to do some damage on you. So if you just declare the charge, you do run the risk that I could do something to you at the cost of command points. Okay. So what would you like to make the charge? Um. I don't think it's likely I'll get close to you, right? It, it's not. It's yeah. it's a. You're taking the chance from a strategic standpoint. Mm -hmm. You'd be taking the chance to get lucky. Pretty lucky. Eleven mm -hmm. on two dice is really hard. Yeah. Um. Hoping that I don't do any significant damage with my Overwatch, which realistically I shouldn't do much. Right. Um. I'm gonna sit back for now. All right. So that's the end of your turn, and now it's going to go to me. So, start of my turn, just like with you, I am going to gain a command point. Now you can use your command points for a variety of things here. You could also use them to reroll a die per phase. So, like maybe you wanted to reroll one of your to hit rolls with your exocrine. You can spend a command point and reroll one of those. So, that's just something to keep in mind as well. I'm going to advance this chimera. So, it's going to, its base move is 12. It's going to move an additional 6 inches. So, I get 18 inches here really far, just to get myself onto that objective a little bit. Mm -hmm. okay. Now my Basilisk doesn't want to move. Um, I guess it can. Whatever. It's gonna be. <laughs> um, and my Lehman Russ, he's going to stand still. He's pretty happy just getting in a firefight with that Exocrine. Mm -hmm. Let's move these Guardsmen out. They are going to shoot the crap out of these Gene Steelers, or at least try. Miriam's finest right here. And I want to make sure all of my guys get within 12 inches because they have rapid fire weapons. That means if I get them into half range, the range is generally 24 inches. If I get them into half range, which is 12, I get to fire an extra shot. So different weapons have different types of profiles. That's what rapid fire weapons do. And same thing over here. These guards are just going to move out this way. Try to get in rapid fire range with whoever can. It's going to be tough because Ari is hiding behind this wall. So the angle I get to may be tricky. Um, I'm going to move my character over here within three inches of these guys mm -hmm. so that he can't be shot. And I'm going to move my character over here within three inches of these guys so that he can't be shot. And that's basically it. So now I go to the psychic phase. My primary psyker is going to try to cast plus one save onto these guardsmen. So that will make their armor save go from a five up to a four up. Okay. I got it on an eight. You can try to deny the witch if you're within 24 inches with your brute lord because he's also a psyker. Okay. Otherwise, it's just going to go off. 24 inches of my psyker. Oh. Yep. Yeah. So he's a little shy. Yeah. So. They just have plus one armor save. All right. All right. So now I'm going to go to the shooting phase. My commissar here uh, can't do anything of use. So he's just going to do nothing. Same with my premier psyker. So we're just going to fire these guardsmen at these June stealers. So it's one shot per guy normally, but because I'm in rapid fire range, it's two. So there's 10 guys, 20 shots. Two, three. Ten, two shots per guy is 20 shots. Mm -hmm. Follow me? Yep. So my ballistic skill on guardsmen is four. And we're dropping dice. Okay. So it's ballistic skill four, which means I need fours to hit. So I rolled pretty bad, which is very typical. And only got seven hits. Your toughness is four, my strength is three. So just like how your Exocrine was a little bit weaker than my toughness, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit weaker than your toughness, so I need fives to work. Okay. So here I got two wounds through. Now you have an armor save of five plus, um, and I have an AP characteristic of zero. These are just basic guns. Mm -hmm. So you can just take two five plus saves. Okay. Are 
You failed both, which would normally lead me to do damage. Again, one damage into one wound models would kill a guy every time you fail. <laughs> but you have Catalyst up, which is that Psychic Power you cast. So you can now roll those two dice again and try to roll more fives for your five of feeling of pain and stay alive anyway. Okay. And you rolled a five and a six, and nothing happened. Okay. So, over here, guardsmen are gonna shoot. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that can see you in rapid fire range. One guy who can see you that is not in rapid fire range, and we can tell by just using uh, the tape measure as a straight line. Mm -hmm. And these two dudes, uh, they can actually try to shoot this way. He won't have line of sight to anything, but he will. So one guy, and units can fire in all kinds of different directions. Mm -hmm. Each model can just basically shoot one weapon at one unit and another weapon at another unit. It's really cool like that. So seven guys in rapid fire range here, one guy not in rapid fire range there. So the one dude at more than 12 inches, more than half, is only going to get one shot. Mm -hmm. Everyone else who's in rapid fire range will get two. Three. Seven. So these are the first eight models shooting at these gaunts. And then one guy is firing a long shot at those Gene Steelers because he can't see these gaunts. <laughs> this one, he forced to hit over here. Are you following me right now? Yeah. Okay. If I ever go too fast for you, please let me know. I will. So forced to hit because again, I'm ballistic skill four. I'm strength three, you're toughness three, so I need force to wound. Four. So you get four armor saves. So you have I have you have an armor save of six plus, and I have an AP characteristic of zero. So you still actually do get your six plus saves. So take four saves and see how many sixes you roll. Okay. Three. So three guns are gonna die. Okay. One guy actually passes armor save. Yeah. Well, whichever three you like. If you pull models, you can't in this case, that would take you out of coherency because you're so bunched up. Mm -hmm. But like in my case, if I were to pull these two, now my unit would be out of coherency. That could cause some real problems later on. Gotcha. So try to keep yourself in coherency when you can. Okay. Here's the one guy who's shooting those gene stealers. He hits. He does not work. Okay. All right. Now for the big guns. <laughs> so my basilisk is going to try to shoot the back squad of Gene Steelers. He's got D6 shots. So, see, three, so he fires three times. He hits on fours, he hits twice. He's strength nine against your toughness four. So I'm W, w my strength is double your toughness. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna wound you on twos. So I got two wounds. Now Gene Steeler, it's AP characteristic is three. You have a five plus armor save, so this would normally just kill two gene stealers outright. Mm -hmm. You don't get saved, it's damaged a lot, and you have one wound, so you're just dead. Gene stealers have a really cool rule. They have a five plus invulnerable save. This means that you have a, a separate save from your armor save that cannot be modified. Generally speaking, mole saves aren't too great. They're not like two up invulnerables or three up invulnerables. They're usually like four ups or five ups, so a little tougher to pass, but they can't be modified, and you get them regardless of your opponent's AP characteristic. So you're not going to take your armor save because you, you would have to roll sevens, but you can take your invulnerable save, which also coincidentally happens to be five plus in your case. So two five up saves to stay alive. Okay. So one. So one <laughs> dude is just gonna get splattered. All right. The reason they don't get that feel on pain save that these ones did is because you cast a spell only onto that unit. Right. This. Mm-hmm. And now my Lehman Russ is going to shoot that Exocrine right there. Right. Now I have a pretty similar rule to yours where I get to shoot twice if I stand still or I move under half. <laughs> I don't get plus one to hit, however, so I'm only hitting you on fours. So my first volley is D6 shots, one whole shot. I'm gonna use a command point and reroll my number of shots here to try to get a little bit better. <laughs> Way on up from here, there's gonna be four shots. So I need fours to hit here. I only got one hit though. Now I'm strength 8 with my battle cannon versus your toughness 8 exocrine, so I need force to wound. I do wound. I have an AP characteristic of 2. You have a 3 plus armor save, so your 3 up goes to a 5 up. So just see if you pass your save. You do. Alright, nothing happened there. We're going to stick at it. Shoot you again. So this is the second volley. 5 shots this time. Very powerful. So I got 5 attacks, hitting on 4s. 
Nice. Four hits. And strength eight versus your toughness save and fours. Only one wound now. So one more five up armor save because that AP characteristic of two. Mm -hmm. Fails that. So now we've determined how much damage you take. My weapon's characteristic is D3 for the damage, so I have to see how much damage I do to you here. Three. Uh, basically, the way D3s work, if you're not, if you're new to gaming in general, when you, you just roll a D6 like you normally would, on a one or a two, it counts as a one. On a three or a four, it counts as a two. And on a five or a six, it counts as a three. This is just pretty commonly accepted amongst most gamers. So you take three damage on your Exocrine. Right. He starts with 12. So now he's going to go down to nine. I also have a heavy bolter on the front of my tank. Uh, this weapon doesn't get to fire twice, only the main battle cannon does. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to have it shoot straight ahead into your action as well, hitting on force. This is only strength 5 versus your toughness 8. So you're a lot tougher than I am strong, but not quite double. Mm -hmm. So I still wound you on 5s. I don't wound. Nothing happens there. So now it's my turn to try to uh, go to the charge phase. So I could charge these gene skills with my guardsmen, or I could charge these gaunts with my guardsmen. Then my guardsmen will get absolutely destroyed by these gene skills. Even when you charge, you do get to strike first, so I get to hit party first with my guardsmen, but they're, they're not good in combat, so I'll probably kill like a stealer or two, and then the remaining seven or eight will just eat my whole unit for breakfast, so I'm not interested in that. Gaunts, on the other hand, are pretty terrible, so I'm going to try to charge. So you measure the distance between your unit and your unit you try to charge. Here it's uh, six and a half inches or so. So I need to roll to get within one inch of you. So I have to roll six inches, which will put me about half an inch away from you, which is good enough. 10 inches, so I can go as far as I want up to 10 inches. So we're gonna go all the way over here. So now that we've done our charge phase, we can move on to the fight phase. After all the units have charged in, we now Take turns alternating between me and Ari on who selects the units to fight. Any units that charge this turn, so in this case, Justice Guardsman Squad right here, will get to activate. When you select a unit to activate, you can move every model three inches towards the closest model. Now, this may not seem like much, and in this case, it really isn't. It's really just piling in so that everyone gets to attack. In more competitive matches with more adept players, you can really use these pile-ins and little movement tricks in your charge and fight phase to get some serious positional advantage over your opponent. But that's what not what this game's about and we're just going to show off how combat works. Combat is a lot like shooting in that you make certain attacks for your models and then they have to hit and then they wound and they save and determine damage. So all that is mechanically the same. The only difference is how do you determine who gets to fight. So when you're doing close combat, every model within one inch of your enemy model may make an attack. When you make into close combat, every model within one inch of the enemy model may make an attack. Additionally, every model within half of an inch of one of those models, that is within half of an inch of your enemy model, may make an attack. I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but basically it means you can fight in two ranks, essentially like this. So these guys can attack, and these guys can attack. But if I had a guardsman all the way out here, he would be too far to actually hit those gaunts with his bayonet. Are you following that, Ari? Mm -hmm. Okay. So each guardsman has one attack because that's what it says on their attack characteristic. And they don't really have any melee weapons, so they're going to punch you with their bare fists. Some people have really powerful swords or maces or anything like that. And those have weapons have their own stats, just like the battle cannon has its own stats, and you use that weapon. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these guardsmen aren't made for this, and they're just punching you with their bare hands. So we have one attack per guardsman. We have nine regular guardsmen in this unit of ten models. So nine attacks. And then we have a sergeant who also has one attack, but he has a rule that allows him to get plus one attack for being a sergeant. And he gets plus one attack because he actually does have a weapon. It's called a chain sword. Doesn't really do too much, but it gains one additional attack. Mm -hmm. So that guy is going to be swinging with three, while everyone else is swinging with nine. I would normally have to do these separately because they have different stats and whatnot, but against you, with my stats, everything is exactly the same. I'm still hitting on fours, I'm still wounding on fours because my strength is three, your toughness is three, 
and then I have no AP or damage, so nothing actually changes. So I can roll these all together to save some time. So on weapon skill 4, in the shooting you use your ballistic skill to determine what you need to hit, in combat use your weapon skill. So on weapon skill 4, we force the hits. Okay, I'm going to pull my misses. And now I'm strength 3, your toughness 3. So I need fours to wound because we're exactly the same strength versus toughness. I rolled really well to wound, and you have five, six plus armor saves to take. Okay. Failed all five. Mm -hmm. Five gaunts are gonna die. All right. So now you can select your two gaunts to attack. Okay. They can activate the same way I did. So they pile in towards the closest enemy models. They're really right where they want to be anyway. Mm -hmm. And then each one makes an attack. So two models attack characteristic is one. Two attacks. All right. Two hits, your weapon skill four, you hit on fours. Strain three versus my toughest three, so four is to wound. Okay. Nothing to wound. All right. So that's pretty much the end of the combat phase. The last thing to do here is the morale phase. So the morale phase is when you see who is going to poop their pants and run away. You take any unit that suffered casualties this turn and take the number of casualties they suffered, number of models that were killed, rather, mm -hmm. and then subtract it from the leadership characteristics. So, these gene stealers lost one model. Mm -hmm. Sorry, those ones. Those gene stealers lost one model. Their leadership characteristic is eight. So you take eight, you subtract the one dead guy that gets you to seven. Now you roll one die and try to get equal to or less than a seven. Okay. You're pretty hard. It's, yeah. <laughs> she did it. Proud of you. <laughs> so they don't care. They're fearless. Mm -hmm. They're not fearless because that's, that's its own rule, but they, they don't care yeah. about what's going on. <laughs> These guns, on the other hand, they, they might be in trouble. Yeah. So they're leadership six, not quite as brave as the Gene Sealers, and they lost eight of their buddies this turn. So you are testing at leadership negative two. Ones always pass. So if you just roll a die and get a one, you're good to go. Any other result will fail because it's not a negative two. Okay. Zero <laughs> to six. So what happens when you fail morale is one gaunt eye tails it at you. You're just running out. Then you roll a die for every remaining model in your unit, and if you roll a one, another model dies for each one you roll. If your unit is below half strength, which it's safe right. to say it's below half strength, that result happens on a one or a two. So you roll one die for every model in your unit, just one, mm -hmm. and then on a one or two he's dead, so this guy okay. is going to die too. Scared little creatures. <laughs> and that is going to be it. So that's my turn, and now we go to Ardis. So start of the command phase on turn two, we're going to determine how many points Ari scores. So I'm on this objective, I'm on this objective, and I'm on this objective and this objective. So I'm on four. Ari's certainly not on four. She's not going to score old board. Ari is on one objective, so she's going to score five points for her primary. Keep track over here. You have five points for starting for holding one objective at the start of your turn. <laughs> if you were on two, if those guns survived, you might have held ten. <laughs> Then you gain another command point, so you're going to go up to 14. All right, and that's the end of your command phase. Now we go to your movement phase, and you can move around the table. All right. Hmm. What are you thinking right now? I think I'm going to send these guys over here at you. And yep, that, that seems like a thing you should do. OK. Um, you could even see what they result and uh, what their advance roll is, because they could potentially get all the way up to here, and mm -hmm. that would be a pretty easy charge here, which would free up these guys to actually come this way, and because they're infantry, charge through the wall and kill them. Right, I forgot so about the wall thing. So you kill both of those in one move. <laughs> okay. So I would start here and right. see what they get, because this one has the most options, and this one's a pretty binary decision. It's whether or not you roll far enough to make this a viable option, or whether or not you may roll far enough to make that a viable option. Right. So see what they go. Um, that's... Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you, you can advance and charge because you're playing Gene Stealers. Mm -hmm. So you roll one die and add it to your move characteristic. Okay. Which is eight? Eight. Okay. So they're going to go ten inches, which is not bad. You can get all the way up to here. And then you're within five inches, so it would be a four-inch charge. Not too hard to roll four on two mm -hmm. dice. Alternatively, you could go ten inches to here. This is a bit further, you have to get on the other side of the wall, so you'd need like a seven or so. So I think they're better off trying to go this way while they come this way. You have an abundance of command points here. 
you can use command points to re-roll things like advance rolls. So you could spend a one, you know, 14, to re-roll this two and try to get higher. Now, of course, there's a risk you roll the one, risk you still roll a two, but it's your decision. Right. Um, I think I'm going to move them up here. Okay. Not going to re-roll that command point? Nah. So 14, uh, 10 inches, and then get them right there. Mm -hmm. And they can't all go in a straight line like before because they're going to hit this roadblock. Right. So they can go around like that, mm -hmm. and then a few might straggle behind a little bit, but that's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Just try to keep straight which gene sealers and which unit, which shouldn't be too hard after this unit moves. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go move that unit. Okay, and I'm going to try moving them that way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to advance them. Yep. So 5 plus 8 is going to be 13, much better. See how close you can get to the wall that way. Pretty much right up against it. So I'm gonna move on. There should be ten of that squad. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the Broodlord can move. Uh, I'm going to advance him as well. Mm -hmm. 14, and he moves 8, so he could also try to charge into here and really just keep on the pressure, or he could do his own thing. Um, I'm gonna move him up here. Okay. So 14 do... inches, and you gotta go around your gene stealers. This is off the table. Right. Right there. And should I keep him a little behind, or? Well, you can. You can right now, and they'll be really safe because if I fail to, if you fail the charge, then I won't be able to shoot him. If he's in front, I would be able to shoot him. Okay. But you can also try to visualize what your turn is going to look like. These guys get another activation to move when you make the charge move, and they'll right. end up in front of him again. Okay. Then so. I'll just keep him there. Yep. So okay. then your Exocrine, he probably wants to stand still. Yeah. So that's what he does. And the last decision point you have are your three little rippers. They can come in on turn two or turn three. This is now turn two. When they show up, they have to show up nine inches away from the enemy. So there's not too much for them to do right now, <laughs> but they're only here to really hold objectives. So what I would recommend doing is maybe getting them out over here and just do it on their own, but it gives makes these guys have to go that way to deal with it, otherwise you hold that objective, and then I'm not sending my reinforcements back to solving this problem, so you're giving me a lot of things to worry about all at once. Okay. Um, I or, like the sound of that. Yeah. Or you could wait out and see if there's a better opportunity to come in on turn three, but that's pretty much your decision point. I think I'm going to send them out now. Okay. So they can go wherever they want on the board, just more than nine inches from any enemy okay. models. I'm going to put them over here. Yeah. That's perfectly fine. More than nine. Good to go. Okay. All right. So then we have the Psychic Phase once again, you're done with the movement. So the only spells you can cast here are Catalyst and Broodlord, so again, uh, you also have Smite, which is a damage thing spell that every Psyker knows. Goes off on a 5, where your Catalyst goes off on a 6, you roll two dice to try to cast it just like usual. And then it does D3 Mortal Wounds to the nearest visible enemy unit, so in this case it'll be D3 Mortal Wounds here. So if you pass it, you'll just roll a D3, in that case a 2, and two guys will die. No gotcha. big deal. Or you can try to give that 5 of Pheomal Pain, to any of your units? Um, I think I'm going to Catalyst. Okay, so who wants some Catalyst? Or hmm. well, you can see if you pass it first. Yeah, so, true. You know, um, don't so dwell on decision, that doesn't matter. Two, right? two dice, and you have to roll a six because that's what it says. Okay. You got a seven. Okay. I am in deny range now with my Psyker, so I can try to deny the Witch. I have to roll more than a 7, so I need a higher on my two dice. Okay. And this puts an interesting decision point on to you. You may really want Catalyst. You rolled a 7, which passes, but you might want to try to pass harder. So you could spend a command point, again, you have 14, to re-roll the entire test. You can't just re-roll the 1, you have to roll both dice, to try to get like an 8, 9, 10 yourself. You run the risk of rolling lower, potentially failing the spell altogether, or just making it easier for me to deny. So, sevens are like that awkward number where you're not really sure what to do. It's totally your call. Um, I'm going to leave it at seven. Okay, so I'm going to try to deny it. I need an eight. I roll a six. I'm going to spend one of my command points. So I'm going down to eleven to try to reroll this deny the witch attempt. And I got didn't get it on a four, so Catalyst goes off. Who wants some Catalyst? Um, I'm thinking these guys. Okay. So they'll have that five of feel and pain. Perfectly mm -hmm. fun choice. And then we go over to our shooting phase. So here's an interesting one. You can, of course, keep just getting the shooting or exocrine versus the universe. That's mm -hmm. nice and obvious. The other thing you can do is have this exocrine shoot this primary psyker. 
because I had my unit here mm -hmm. declare a charge successfully on the Gaunts, they basically ran forward and left their little buddy behind, and now he's not within three inches of anything, so you can just blast him in the face. Um, uh, he's not hard to kill. Mm -hmm. You'd probably one-shot him. He's basically two, four of these guys glued together. Um, but he's also not that impactful, whereas this kind of sort of does something. So it's your choice. Do you want to get the easy kill? He's not useless. He does give psychic powers, tries to deny yours unsuccessfully. <laughs> You can do stuff, or you just try to win this war with the Um, I'm gonna go for your Psyker. Okay, so you fire six shots, and this is one of the nice things about the Axe Weapon, it fires twice, so you can probably finish him off and then still do right. some damage. So you get six shots again. You're hitting on threes, because you stood still, you get that plus one to hit. Alright, only three hits, your strength seven versus my toughness three, so you need twos to wound. Three wounds. All right, so uh, it's AP three. I'm a five plus armor save, so I can't roll seven or I can't roll eights on d sixes. <laughs> so I'm gonna take six damage, two for each one that goes through. So six damage. He's a four wound model. He's just gonna die. All right, and then I'm gonna shoot again at your tank. Yep. So six shots again. Okay. And same thing hitting on threes, just like before. Ah, the two's there. Only two hits. Now you could see, use a command point to reroll a hit roll here. Again, you have 14, but otherwise you don't have to. Uh, I'm just gonna do this. Okay, so two hits and fives to wound. This is strength seven versus top is eight. You got one still, so I have one six up save to make after you take the AP modifier into account. Roll to four, I'm gonna take two damage, go down to six wounds. All right. So that's going to be it for your shooting phase, and now you go to your charge phase. So you go take turns with your units, one at a time, mm -hmm. and declare what units you're trying to charge, and see if you make it. Right. Who would like to go first? Uh, I think I'm going to start over here. Okay. So those gene stealers are going to try to charge these guardsmen. I'm going to spend one command point mm -hmm. to attempt to overwatch you, so everyone makes a last ditch attempt to shoot. Everyone's within 12 inches. So two shots per guy, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hitting you on sixes. I got four hits. And hitting on sixes despite my ballistic skill four plus because Overwatch says you only ever hit on sixes. This is a strategy. So four hits, I'm strength three to your toughness four, so I need fives to wound. I got two wounds through, so you have two five plus saves to make. Alright. Failed one, so one gene sealer is just gonna die. Okay. This catalyst is now moved over over here. Does it matter which one or I'd like to take the back ones because they're the okay. least likely to be impactful in the game now. Now you're trying to charge in from the front. So go ahead and roll your charge distance. So two D6. Okay. You got an eight. So every model can move up to eight inches towards those guardsmen. Okay. They don't have to go towards the guardsmen technically. They could go backwards if they wanted. Right. But go that's towards the, the point. Guardsmen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So eight and inches. Um, so move them first, and they'll have to move around the brute board, which is annoying, but mm -hmm. that's the way this game works. So you can move the front model here, mm -hmm. and you can get him all the way out to here to make some space for your other models. Like so. And then those guys can just kind of shuffle through. And you're going to try to leave space for your Broodlord to also get in mm -hmm. right here, because he's also pretty good in combat himself. Okay. Right. And now that Broodlord's going to try to charge in, I'm sure. Yes. So see what he rolls. He's got four inches. Now that's not a great charge roll, but four inches is plenty. So he's gonna just sneak on up. Okay. Right. And then finally, we have this charge here, the Gene Steelers with the Guardsmen. Mm -hmm. So see what you make it. I can't overwatch you again because you can only use the overwatch strat once per phase. Also, I'm staring at a wall. <laughs> so you go nine inches, you can go just the other side here, you could really go deep into my unit with nine inches and get on this side of me closer to these guys. You could really go get creative with nine inches on this one. So 
go wherever you'd like. Um, I think I am going to come around here. Sure. And the only reason they can Kool-Aid man through that wall is because they are infantry. Mm -hmm. Things like tanks or cavalry or bikes would have to go around. All right, so now you get to select all of your charging units before I select any of my units to pick to be selected for for combat. In this case, all of your units charged. Right. So you can just pick any of them and start swinging. Okay. Should I go back over here? Oh, it doesn't really matter. Okay. There are considerations to this in a more competitive game, but... Uh, just... Okay, I'm going to go back over here. All right, so who wants to go first? The Broodlord or the Gene Stealers? Um... I recommend moving, doing the Broodlord first to give your Stealers some more room to fight. So here's what I mean by that. Remember how I was saying that you can only fight if you're within half an inch of a model within half of an inch? That means these dudes back here are straggling and they're not going to be able to attack. Mm -hmm. But if the Broodlord attacks and uses his pylons and consolidates to get over here, yeah. it opens up a lot of space for these dudes to pile in the side here, mm -hmm. and then more of their buddies will get to attack. So I'd recommend starting with the Broodlord to maximize your efficiency here. All yep. right. That, that makes sense? Good. Yeah. Okay. So Broodlord has six attacks because he's your monster. Okay. Um, he hits on twos because he's weapon skill two plus, so six attacks. Hitting on twos. So ones are bad. Yeah, you know, one one. You strength six, I'm toughness three, you're double, so you wound on twos. Okay. So same um, dice. And he has a special rule that allows him to reroll failed to wound roll, so you get to reroll ones here. Okay. Alright, still until one. So four wounds. Your AP three, I have a five up save. I actually have a four up save because my spell is still active from the last turn to give me plus mm -hmm. one save. A four up at minus three AP will still kill me, and I'm gonna lose four guys. Okay. Now your Broodlord gets to finish his activation, which means he gets to consolidate. Consolidations are just like pylon moves where you move closer towards the nearest enemy, um, but it happens at the end of the fight. So you can use this to get your Broodlord closer to this guy by going over here, and just getting out of the way, clearing some room for these genes to Okay, that's good. And then I can move these yep. guys up more. So they're going to move three inches, again, towards the closest guy. So this gun's actually going to pass him. Mm -hmm. So this one's going to pass this dude. He's starting about an inch and a quarter away from passing him over here. Definitely getting closer mm -hmm. from where he started, but kind of passing him. Same thing over here. And then over here. Everyone is definitely getting closer. Mm -hmm. Got to get closer to lunch. These dudes are going to get within half of an inch of... You follow that? Yeah. Okay. So, the Dream Stealers have three attacks each. So, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Gene Stealers. This is going to be 24 attacks. And remember when I said the Broodlord buffs them? He gives them plus one to hit. So, weapon skill is three plus. So, normally threes to hit. But because they're near the Broodlord, it's going to be twos to hit. Weapon skill two plus. Okay. So 24 attacks, three times the number of Gene Stealers attacking. You can choose which weapon you want to attack here with. You can choose your Scything Talon or your Rending Claws. So Gene Stealers are made for close combat. They have a variety of weapons for different situations. The difference between Scything Talons and Rending Claws, they're the same strength, same damage, but the AP is different. Rending Claws are AP 1, which will take my 4-up armor save to a 5-plus armor save. And when you roll sixes to wound, it becomes AP four, so my four of armor save just won't even get a save every time okay. you roll six. Scything talons, alternatively, don't have AP at all, so I'll be getting four up saves, but allow you to reroll ones to hit. Mathematically, it's better to use the rending clause, so I recommend doing that. Mm -hmm. But you do have the option. Yeah, I'm gonna. Oh, you're gonna do the rending yeah. clause. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so th two is to hit because you're brood lord. Okay. And just pull out the ones. There's one snuck onto his okay. base there. And then your strength four to my toughness three. So you need threes to wound. So roll all those again. Twos. Okay. 
So six is our AP four, so that's just going to kill somebody. And then everyone out over here gets a save. Your AP minus one, I have a four plus armor for my spell, so I'm gonna be taking five plus armors. I made one, so you're gonna kill nine guardsmen plus the one guardsman, you've killed ten. There's only five left, so they are super dead. Okay. And now you can use your consolidation move on these gene stealers to go towards the closest enemy, now the commissar, and simultaneously end up in front of your broodlord there, so I can't just blow him up with big guy. Mm -hmm. Follow me on that? Yeah. Combat phase can be very tricky, so if you're going too fast, just let me know. Okay. Uh, over here, we've got the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. Now you have 10 gene stealers still. And they don't have a Broodlord buff, so you have 30 attacks this time, but they're hitting on threes. Okay. <laughs> Need more dice. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so I think that's exactly 30, if okay. I can hold the other five. Yeah, you can just roll them in batches okay. too if you want. <laughs> I like rolling them all at once, but <laughs> I'm crazy like that. You can at least fight two. Okay. So remember, we're hitting on threes because your weapon skill three plus. Mm -hmm. on the ones and twos. So now you roll all of those again to wound. Right. Your strength four on toughness three. What do you need to wound? That was a nine. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> like, oh no. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh boy, I'm a mess. So I'm strength, your strength four on toughness three. What do you think you need? Sorry? Your strength four okay. on toughness three. Do you know what you need to wound? I've been counting on you to tell me numbers. Okay, it's threes. <laughs> Same thing that happened here. When you're stronger than I am tough, mm -hmm. it's threes. Okay. Unless you're double, then it's twos. Okay. Mm -hmm. So threes to wound. All right, and again, we're going to pull the ones and twos. Same rule as last time, too. We're going to swing with our rending claws again. So every six you get is going to be AP four a lot of sixes this time. So six guys are just gonna die. Okay. And then all of these guys, they're not buffed by my spells. So they have five up saves. It's gonna go to six up saves because they're AP one. All of those die. Okay, so I have no more guards made over here. All right. And that is going to be that. So that's pretty much it for your turn. You did quite a bit there. I'm basically out of guards, except for the 10 in the Chimera. And it goes to my turn. So. Oh, oh boy. That's okay. Just grab it. I'm going to go up to 11 command points. And for victory points here, I am on this objective with my lone commissar. And I'm on this objective with my basilisk. And I'm on this objective with my hellhound. Mm -hmm. Or my chimera. You're on three objectives yourself, the Rippers, the Gene Stealers, and the Exocrine, so I don't hold more than you. Great move putting the Rippers there. So I'm only going to score 10 points. And now, what do these do? The points are determined who wins the game. Okay. Who has the more of these at the end of the game. All right. So I do have a, a fairly sizable lead right now, 10 to 5, but you also have to consider this is a five-turn game, not a two-turn game. Mm -hmm. So you have plenty of time to make that up, and I, you just did a pretty big blow to my army, so I have to do, have a big turn here. So I'm going to get out of my transport at the start of my movement phase, which means everyone has to get out within three inches of the vehicle, just like that, it's nice and within three inches, and then they also get to move. So we're going to move them six inches, and again, Kool-Aid Manning through the wall, because they are infantry, <laughs> we're going to try to get them to rapid fire these jeans. Over here, the camera is just going to hang out, drive a little bit, try to get some line of sight onto the rippers. I like to check line of sight with my tape measure when it's hard to bend down. Obviously, it's a straight line. Eyeballs are straight lines. Pretty simple. My lone commissar is just going to wander over here and try not to get killed. And that's pretty much it. So let's do some shooting. Okay. I would have a psychic phase, but you killed my psyker. So all of these dudes are going to rapid fire these gene stealers. So I have 10 dudes in range, rapid fire range for half distance for 20 shots. Let's skill three plus and four is to hit. Amazing hits. I could do like that all the time, I would never lose. 
Times three and three, and your top is four, and your five to load. You have four armor saves to take. Okay. Your armor save is four plus, it's five plus, so just regular old four or five ups. And then you have catalyst as well, so you can roll again to see if you ignore it. Right. So four are gonna fail their saves, and then you have four female pains from catalyst. Okay. Rolls again. And now two are gonna die. So just two dudes died. Nice save from catalyst there. Okay. Whichever two you like. Over here, my Chimera is going to fire. It's got its heavy bolter into the Ripper Swarms. Two hits. I'm strength five, your toughness three, and threes to wound. One wound. It's AP one, and you have a six up save, so you can't actually take a save from that, so you're going to take one damage. <laughs> Ripper Swarms are really annoying, as most swarms in the game are. And they actually have three wounds each. I'm only going to do one damage to one Ripper. Then I have a multi-laser on top as well, so three more shots. Two hits there. Strength six to your toughness three, so two's to wound on this one. Two wounds. Now you will get six up armor saves from that, so you get two six ups. We fail them both, so we are going to kill a base. So even though it's only three models here, it's still nine wounds worth of stuff, because each model has three wounds. So it takes a lot of firepower to kill those rippers. <laughs> so over here, we're gonna have the Lehman Russ abandon ship about that exocrine and try to chip up these gene stealers here since they don't have female pain. We have six shots in the first one. We need fours to hit. Four hits, nice cool. And twos to wound because I'm strength eight to your toughness four. <laughs> Fail, I did four wounds, so you get four, five plus invulnerable saves here. I am AP2, so you don't get your armor saved, so you're taking your invulnerable, but it's five either way. Mm. So two are gonna die. I'm just gonna pull it back two for you. Okay. And then we're gonna shoot again as I drop dice. Same thing. D6 shots. It's five. Nice rolls. And need fours to hit. Two hits only and twos to wound. One wound only. So just one five plus save there. Mm. We did chip up those gene stealers a fair bit, but let's see if the heavy bolter does anything. Two hits, threes to wound, two more saves. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna kill one more. Making some progress here. Might be a little too a little too late. This commissar is gonna shoot a bolt pistol at those gene stealers, which hits. And it's actually a last pistol, so it doesn't wound. It's only strength three that you're talking this four and it fives. Last but not least, I have the Basilisk here. Basilisk is going to try to uh, ship up these a little bit harder. I would like them gone. With six shots again, crazy number of shots here. Now I need fours to hit. I have three hits. And I need twos to wound, strength nine. So you have three more invulnerable saves to take. One more now. All right, so you still have a healthy three Gene Stealers. Not too shabby. I could go to the charge phase here. I don't want to tangle with that still. It's quite scary. And I definitely don't want to tangle with that. So we're going to call it a day. And it's going to be Ari's turn. So you're going to gain a command point. Go up to 15. And let's check the objectives. I'm on 1, 2, 3. Um, realistically, you don't want to pull yourself right. off of that objective. So we'll just say you pull all these front ones instead. Right. Um, so you are on one, two, three. You're not holding more, but you are at least on two. So you're going to score 10 points here, but you had a solid 15 points. Okay. You following how we're doing the scoring? Yeah. Okay. So now you go to your movement phase and you can just move around. Okay. Mm, I'm going to start with boys over there. Mm -hmm. the puppies? Yes, the puppies. <laughs> um, I'm going to advance them. Sure. So they're going to go nine inches this time. Mm -hmm. And they can just go on a little mission, I think would be wise, to just go eat this commissar. Yeah. <laughs> Don't bite off more than three little guys can chew. And uh, that should be plenty for them. Right. Let's see what the big guy rolls. Yes. Also, also one. one. So this might be a time where you want to spend your 
one of your 15 command points to try to see if he goes a little bit further? I'm going to do that. Okay. You're, okay. you're not rolling well here. So nine inches, can't get you to do too much. You can help out your friend, really kill this guy, and set yourself up for a, not a too long of a charge into this Lehman Russ, but it's not an automatic charge. Well, you, that's can, about as yeah, good as not, I can do. Yeah, not much else you can do yeah. with that. Okay. And okay. if you do want to go for the charge, you need a six. Okay. And then you have these dudes here. Um, I'm going to fix them. Oh, I'm sorry, here. we forgot something. Your three gene stealers here did lose five models, so they are going to have to take a morale test. Your leadership eight, and you lost five, so your eight goes to a three. So roll one die and see if you roll equal to or less than a three. Good. So you could reroll that if you want to try to pass it. Otherwise, you're just running. I'm going to reroll it. Okay. Alternatively, you could spend two command points before we even see what the first result is, or whatever, <laughs> to just automatically pass the morale. It's two command points, but you're not risking anything. I'll do that. I've been okay. kind of stockpiling them. Yeah, yeah, quite a few. <laughs> nice place to burn them. So they're going to automatically pass the morale test. That's a generic stratagem everyone has access to. Mm -hmm. All right, then we're back to over here. Right. Um, I'm going to try to advance them mm -hmm. over to your guys. Yep. Oh my goodness, all the ones. Well, on the bright side, they're right there already. <laughs> yeah. So nine inches, you want to grab a tape measure? Right. And they're also eight, so it's yep. nine. Mm-hmm. Out. Yeah, right so on them. Yeah, right on them. Yeah. No problem at all. And one thing you want to do here, uh, really cool stuff, is if we both have models on the ob objective, mm -hmm. then it's contested. It's whoever has more models. But right now, uh, so assuming my guardsmen die, I'm only going to have the Chimera. Mm -hmm. So if you can use your charge move and your pilot and consolidate to even get one gene stealer onto the objective, mm -hmm. when it goes back to my turn, I'm not going to control this, so I'm not going to score any points for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's a, a large part of this game is right. learning how to contest objectives. All right. All right. Um, and these guys can't move, can they? They can move. Oh, uh, well, once they I'm do strike, still... they can move, but they're, they're yeah. doing their job. I, I don't want to. I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I think we're mm -hmm. good. Let's go to the right. psychic phase. Over here, your brood lord once again can either cast Smite or Catalyst. Now your army's getting a little bit more spread out. Mm -hmm. Catalyst has an 18-inch range, so these guys have extended themselves too far, right. say with the big guy. So you could cast it on the three man himself, <laughs> or just do a smite into the little guy, which will be D3 wounds. He's got mm. four wounds. So you wouldn't be able to kill him with D3, but you could make your life easier. It's probably good either way, but it would pretty much secure it. I might as well. Or you could feel and pain yourself. That's a choice. <laughs> I, I think I'll smite. Okay. okay, so you have to roll a five on two dice, just okay. like a normal safe test. I, this one goes off on a five. You okay. did it, and I don't have a Psyker to deny you with because you killed them, so just D3 mortal wounds. All right. So, all so. D3. One, one dice, right. and we're going to convert it. So remember, a 1 and 2 counts as a 1, mm -hmm. a 3 and 4 counts as a 2, 5 and 6 counts as a 3. Right. Homeboy's got one wound left. Okay. <laughs> all right, and that's going to be it for that, so we go to shooting. Gene Steelers and Brood Lords don't shoot, so just the big guy. All righty. Um... So he could go for my Chimera, I'm pretty sure he's got line of sight sideways there, or he could just continue the war. I'm going to keep going at your tank over there. Alright, so six shots. Alright, four hits, and again you can always command point reroll one of these if you want. And then your strength seven still to my toughness eight. I'm tougher than you are strong. You're gonna need fives. Okay. Three wounds though, okay. very strong. So I need three, uh, three up armor saves minus three AP goes to six ups. Three six ups. I pass two. Wow. All right. <laughs> Sometimes dice be like that. I, go, I take two damage and go down to four. Okay. So you can fire again, of course. I will be doing that. So four hits there, mm -hmm. and then your strength seven and my toughness eight, so you need fives again. Mm -hmm. I don't. Was it three hits? Well. Okay, I was gonna have you. So three hits, and then um, fives to wound. One, so one six up. Bells, he's down to two. Very consistently doing four damage. Right. <laughs> um, all right. 
So I think that's just about it for your shooting. So you can go to charging. You could try to charge the Brood Lord here. You need a six, but I could actually hurt you with Overwatch. I am hitting on sixes though, so it's not too, too bad. You do have six wounds. So I have to, a lot has to go right for me to kill you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you make the charge, the Brood Lord almost certainly kills this guy. Or you just take the low hanging fruit. And um, I'm gonna go after your tank. All right, well, I'm gonna take the shot. We're gonna do that Overwatch. I got D6 shots. Now, I didn't move, mm -hmm. so I would normally get to fire twice, but that rule only works in my shooting phase. Mm -hmm. Right now we're in your charge phase, so I'm just shooting out a sequence so okay. I don't get to fire twice. So D6 shots, two whole shots. I don't like that. We're gonna command point this. Mm -hmm. We gotta get lucky over here. Three shots, mm -hmm. excellent. Can I get triple sixes? Not a one, all right. So we failed the, to hit you. And uh, you need a six inch charge to make it here. So see if you make it. That is... Uh, two dice. It's two. Yep. There's so many numbers. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's overwhelming. You'll get used to it. So eight inches is plenty. <laughs> and you're just gonna... Head back right my off there. Yep. Now these guys probably just want to charge my little dude. Yeah. All right, I'm just gonna do that for yeah. you. <laughs> and then over here, we're gonna charge those guardsmen. And remember what I said about trying to use that charge move? To get onto the objective so right. i can't overwatch you because i can only use that stratagem once per phase so see if you see what your role is and see how you make it okay throw it over here so we're gonna go 20, 12 inches so you can go wherever the hell you want right but you don't need to go too crazy you're mm -hmm. just trying to kill the guys right in front of you and <laughs> get onto the objective there okay um i'll just kind of move them mm -hmm. back here yep that's totally good and just remember coherency, so everyone has to be within two inches of someone else from your unit. Okay. It's all good. Is that good? So this guy is not in coherency, because he has to be within two inches of two moms from So what you could oh, want to do is make a ring around my squad. Okay. And then... This ring means everyone, this guy's been to them, them, everyone is the right. buddy system, everyone okay. is happy. So, coherence is funky, it does take some getting used to, mm -hmm. but it's not too bad once you do get used to it. So again, you have three attacks per model, uh, and you have four, eight models, so 24 attacks. Okay. You're gonna hit on threes, because your weapon skill three, you're not near your broodlord, and all right, let's see what you get. All right. One and twos, easy enough. Your strength four versus my toughness three, so all this three is to wound. Okay. Okay. So two guys are going to die because again, Running Claws are AP minus four. <laughs> and then I have this many saves at six plus because you're AP minus one. I make two, I fail six plus those two. So eight guys are going to die. I'm going to have just two measly guardsmen left. Six, seven, eight. Okay, and then you go to your next charging unit, which will be... Uh, Either of these two, you could do your three gene stealers or you could do your blue board. Um, I'm. Hmm. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Anymore. I'm gonna do my gene stealers. Okay. Um, so they have three attacks each. There's three models, so nine attacks. Okay. Alright, so you're hitting on threes because your weapon skill three plus. Mm -hmm. Wounding on threes. Four. So this is AP four, so I'm not gonna get a save there. And then these are AP, or actually I have a five up invulnerable save for my refractor field, which I did pass. Okay. These are AP one, so my five arm will go to a six up, but I'm gonna take my five up refractor field too. I fail one of those. Unfortunately, I have one room left. That's mm -hmm. just it. Commissar down. Finally, we have the Broodlord. He's got six attacks, just like before. He hits on twos. All right. 
Nice, beautiful six hits. Mm -hmm. You strain six versus my toughness eight, so I am tougher than your strong screen. Fives to wound here. Okay. But again, that reroll to wound that he has just innately built in is going to come in really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, you rolled two sixes, and Broodlords have another cool roll. When you roll six to wound, just like Gene Stealers, they get AP four. This dude gets AP six. So I'm not taking a save from that, and uh, he's going to explode. Okay. So, or he's going to die. When tanks die, they roll a d6. Mm -hmm. On a 6, they explode and do damage to everyone nearby. Gotcha. I didn't roll 6, so he's just going to collapse into a pile of rubble Alrighty. and die in a ball of sadness. All right. Well, that was a pretty good turn. I do get to attack back, though, with my two remaining guardsmen from this close combat. So what happens when you fight combat and people survive, just mm -hmm. like those gaunts, I get to attack back. Okay. I hit you on force. Okay. Good talk. Um, and now I owe you a morale check. So you killed eight out of the ten guardsmen. Mm -hmm. I'm leadership seven, so I'm testing a negative one. I will pass on a one, however. I rolled a four, so one dude is going to run. And then I have an attrition test, so uh, normally I roll a d6 for every remaining model in my unit. In this case, there's only one remaining model, so I roll one d6. And then normally be on a one, that guy's going to die, but because the unit is below half strength, fewer than five models of the ten man, mm -hmm. I, have to, I die on a one or a two here. And I got a six, so we're all right. So there's one guardsman stuck. <laughs> okay. okay. So now it's my turn. I am still controlling two objectives, holding this one here and this one, or no, I'm sorry. I'm only controlling one objective. My basilisk is at this one. My chimera was holding this one, but now Ari has contested it with these gene stealers. So I'm gonna score five points. And just like that, you can start to see how the tide of the battle is shifting. I started out strong with my 10 to her 5 on the victory point scoreboard, but she's killed most of my stuff at this point, and she's catching up in points. It's only turn 3. She's got turns 4 and 5 to seal the deal. So let's see what I can do. It really isn't much. Let's drive this Chimera around. Try to kill out these Rippers. And call it a day. So my Basilisk is going to try to shoot those Rippers. Five shots. Floors to hit. Two hits only. Two is to wound. One wound only. So one is not going to get a save because AP3 and I am D3 damage. So I do one whole damage to a ripper. And they have and three? They have three. Okay. If I had rolled a three there, it would have been three damage, kills a base. Gotcha. So that two means two wounds remaining. So the heavy bolter here is going to shoot the ripper from the chimera. This one's cocked. Got two hits. And threes to wound here. One wound, it's AP1. You have a six up save, so it's just going to do another damage to this guy. And then the multi laser on top, two hits. Strength six versus toughness three is twos to wound. One wound only, so you get one six plus armor save. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nope. So. Okay. <laughs> so that dude's gonna go down. Alright. Alright. So. Now we have close combat. That was the it for my shooting phase. Uh, when no one's charged, which is the case we're currently in, <laughs> the person whose turn it's not gets to go first. Okay. Very counterintuitive. So it's my turn. <laughs> we have to fight this close combat because enemy models are near each other. We need to keep doing that in my turn and your turn. <laughs> Since it's my turn and no one's charged, you get to go first. So all those gene stealers get to activate right now. Pile in towards my guardsmen, mm -hmm. and you can put a uh, casual 24 attacks into him. I'm just going to say he's dead so you don't have to waste yeah, the time okay. here. Okay, sounds good. And then they get to consolidate. After they're done fighting with the fight sequence, they get three inches towards the nearest enemy model. Now, usually this means that they get to just mock around where they are. Because they killed everybody, they can go three inches towards this chimera if they like. So they can, some of them can go through the wall while the others stay behind. They can all go this way. Um, it's just free movement, so you may as well take it. Right, yeah. Um, Three inches. All right. And then it is your turn. So, again, you're going to go up to 13 command points. And we're going to check the objectives again. So now you're holding this one because mm -hmm. I've vacated it and died. Mm -hmm. You're holding this one and you're holding this one. So you're holding three. This one's contested because I have one model, you have one model, mm -hmm. the same. And I have one. So you have three to my one, so you get five points for holding one, mm -hmm. five points for holding two for 10, 
and 15 points total for holding more than me. <laughs> so you're gonna get 15 more points this turn and put you at a nice 30 to 15 lead here. You follow how we got there? Yeah. Okay. And now you can move your stuff. All right. Hmm. I'm gonna start over there. Sure. And... and I can move for you just to see how far you yeah. go. <laughs> um, you get your advance rolls. So, I'm starting with my... This little dudes? Yeah. Those puppies. Puppies. Yeah. So where would they like to go? Um... I'm gonna move them over here, I it's can make a it. great play, yeah. yeah. A lot of people just go forward, try to kill my Basilisk, <laughs> but honestly, this isn't doing anything for me. It's popping pot shots, killing half of a Ripper a turn, and standing on this objective. If you want to try to control more objective, that's how you score more points in this game. Mm -hmm. So great play right there. All right. What about this dude? Uh, I'm gonna try to move him onto that one. Makes sense. Okay. And, now, um, a little bit of a more advanced tactic you can do here. <laughs> you can have these gene stealers in screening for this broodlord so you can't be shot. Remember, characters can't be shot if they're within three inches of another unit. <laughs> so you can use gene stealer right here holding the objective. Mm -hmm. Gene stealer right here within two inches of him because it's coherency. Yeah. And then a gene stealer over here also in coherency, mm -hmm. but now within three inches of the Broodlord, so now he can't get shot. Right. So just free bonus value you're taking, making use of. Mm -hmm. All right, now you have those gene stealers there. Right. Um, I want to keep them here. Yeah, they can just chill right there. Yeah. And uh, there comes a point in games, uh, typically not this early, um, mm -hmm. where the battle is kind of it finished and then it's just playing for the points at the end. Yeah. Uh, this doesn't always happen, but it seems to be happening now, so nothing wrong with just chilling and setting on your enormous advantage. Mm -hmm. So that dude probably just wants yeah. to stand still and blast my camera in the face. Yep. Uh, there's not even really a point to casting psychic powers unless you want a catalyst like these three gene stealers to maybe help them stay alive. I mean, I might as well. Might as well, Won't yeah. Won't hurt. Um, mm -hmm. so. so you roll two dice, you need to roll six. And you got it. So they feel no pain, makes them a little bit more annoying. Mm -hmm. And then the Exocrine, six shots downtown at the Chimera. Yep. So threes to hit. All hit, okay. Uh, your strength seven, and I'm only toughness six now. These things qu aren't quite as tough as this. <laughs> so you're actually going to be wounding on threes, not fives. Right. Because you're a little bit stronger than I am tough. <laughs> so threes to wound. All six, all right. Okay. AP three to my six plus armor save. It's going to be six up saves here, which I fail five, and he takes ten damage. He only has ten wounds. I'm going to see if he explodes into a fiery ball of death. He oh. does. <laughs> so every unit within six inches, so not those gene stealers, but yes, that ripper swarm, mm -hmm. is going to take D3 mortal wounds. Okay. Basically get hit by a smite. <laughs> Fiery wreckage. Does two damage to a pile of rippers. Okay. 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 So he's dead too. Now, I believe that's the end of your turn. Your Exocrine can actually shoot again, but there's, there's nothing really yeah. to shoot at. So, my turn, I'm just going to score five points for minding my own business on my objective. <laughs> uh, I think we can call it here, unless you want to keep going. I, don't really I mean, I get the point. <laughs> you get the point. Yeah. I think we're done learning it's about here. <laughs> yeah, good game, Ari. Right. Yeah, good game. All right. So that was your first game of Warhammer. It was. How would you feel about it? Um, I like it. It was really fun. I had a great time. Awesome. Do you feel like you learned stuff? Do you, is this I, too much for you? Is it sticking with it? I learned a lot and a lot of it's going to stick with me. There's a lot of like numbers going on and I don't remember like how many dice I roll for this certain yeah. thing. A lot of that, the book will tell you that straight mm -hmm. up so I don't have to. And as you familiarize yourself with it, it becomes repetitive. It, you'll, it'll become more second nature like it was for me. Mm -hmm. But that is a bit of a learning curve. It does just take time. Right. Uh, if you go out and play games on your own, I recommend literally taking the codex for your Tyranid army and just... Every time, just look up a stat, you'll, you'll get it. Yeah, yeah. I had a really good time, though. Awesome. Really happy to hear it. So, to the aspiring new Warhammer players of the world, is there anything you want to share? Um, I thought it would be a lot harder. Um, you should definitely pick it up. It's really, really fun, and there are people that are really nice and great that are willing to teach you. It's a good community. So, um, pick it up. Awesome. 
Well, thanks so much, Ari, for coming down. I was happy to demo you. You were a pleasure to teach Warhammer 2. Hopefully, we'll get you uh, more involved in Warhammer than yeah. maybe even on our stream sometimes. I'd love to. Excellent. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you like this video, feel free to give us some likes, give us some love, click that subscribe button. You can check out all of our other content on Twitch, on YouTube, on this channel. We teach a lot of classes over on theartofwar40k.com. We have our own coaching services. This is really geared towards beginners. This video series is all about teaching and learning how to play 40K right now. And that's, uh, that's really important. You gotta start somewhere, right? But if you, wanna, if you liked it and you wanna get into it and you're looking for, uh, just to get better at the game, even if it's beating up your friends, even if it's just winning the game in your local game stores, or you wanna get serious and start competing in real tournaments, we have all of that for you and more. Check out our YouTube channel. Give us that like, subscribe, etc. Please leave a comment with any feedback you have. This is the first time we've ever attempted uh, how to teach Warhammer series, so I'm sure we had some hiccups, could do better next time, whatever feedback you have. Also, uh, just if you think you did a good job, it's nice to hear it. So please uh, interact with us, it makes us happy. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching, everyone.